Turn with me, if you will, uh, to Luke chapter number 5. Luke chapter number 5 is our text this morning, and uh, going to be reading there, verse number 12, down through verse 26, and covering uh, two stories in a way, uh, if you will, but I hope that we'll be able to see some correlation between these two, uh, and, uh, and uh, why um, it does good that they're together. So Luke chapter 5, verse 12, and uh, we'll begin uh, reading here. It says, And while he was in one of the cities, there came a man full of leprosy, and when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and begged him, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him, and he charged him to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing, as Moses commanded for a proof to them. But now even more, the report about him went abroad, and great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities. But he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. On one of those days, as he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem, and the power to, uh, of the Lord was with him to heal. And behold, some men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed, and they were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. But finding no one to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down with his bed through the tiles into the mist before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said, Man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to question him, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? And when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them, Why do you question in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise and walk? But that you may know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And immediately he rose up before them and picked up what had been, laying, what had been lying on and went, uh, went home glorifying God. And amazement seized them all. And they glorified God and were filled with awe, saying, We have seen extraordinary things today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you uh, for this privilege and opportunity uh, to be able to be here this morning. God, we uh, are, are thankful that we uh, serve a God. Uh, we serve um, a Jesus of Nazareth who was willing to come and to die on the cross for our sins, to truly pay for them, uh, to take care of them, to wipe our slate clean and uh, to give us the forgiveness and the freedom. And, uh, Lord, the reminder of songs uh, uh, that has been sung about desiring you, and, Lord, truly desiring a, a, a relationship with you, and, uh, Lord, pursuing that. And, God, I pray that as a result of today's message, that that would be, it, be the attitude of our hearts. God, I pray that you'd help us to see truths from the Scripture. Uh, Lord, I pray that you'd help us not to uh, overemphasize ourselves and underemphasize Jesus, but I pray that you would help us to see uh, Lord, exactly what Jesus wants to do in my life, in, in our lives today. And God, may your will be done for us in your son's precious and holy name we pray. Amen. I would say in my experience that one of the greatest threats uh, to uh, our faith and one of the greatest threats to faith of people that we uh, come in contact with is a, uh, a, a frustration or a concern over a, uh, a, um, a battle within our own minds over uh, the healing nature and the healing power of Jesus Christ. I, I would say that there's, there's not a one of us uh, that has not at some point or time in our lives uh, prayed for someone that was sick, uh, earnestly desired for somebody that we love to be healed and truly cared about and began to question and wonder, is Jesus going to heal? Because when we read passages such as this it is our understanding and the 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 thought that comes across is that Jesus has the power to heal 
But what happens when Jesus does not heal our loved one? What happens when uh, the person that we've cared deeply about does not get any better? Uh, they continue to suffer and struggle and may even come to the point of death over a sickness disease that we prayed about. It really does challenge our belief in God. It challenges our belief that Jesus can do the things that he says he can do, that he has the power, and maybe even question. Well, well, why would Jesus heal this man of leprosy or this paralyzed man and then not heal my loved one or not heal those that I care about? Or in reality, we could look around and say, this isn't even happening today. We, we don't see this transpiring in our time. So why is that? Why did Jesus heal? And better yet, why did Luke record these events for us? Why is it even here if we can't trust Jesus to heal our sickness and our disease? And I hope to be able to answer that question to you this morning as we look at Luke's account of healing about why Jesus healed and, and why Luke would include this in his account of Jesus' life to prove to us that the things we've heard about him is true, to give us a, an accurate account so that our faith can be grounded. Why would he do that? Well, as you look at these two stories, you see uh, really two different interactions. But if you would, the first story of Jesus healing the leper, I, I thought of it and, and think of it kind of as an example of how Jesus healed. And then Luke follows it up with the story of a paralyzed man that is healed and through Jesus' own words gives us sort of an explanation of why he healed and why he went about his ministry uh, the way that he did. And so throughout the message today, we're going to be kind of weaving back and forth uh, between the... the Say, Brother Daniel, that is so obvious. Why are you wasting our time? Well, if it was so obvious, you would be up here and not sitting there, right? No, I'm just kidding. But sometimes we need the obvious reminders of Scripture to help us ground our faith so that we can truly see what Jesus desires to do in our lives, so that we can see uh, the purpose behind these accounts and why Jesus did what he did. So the first thing that I'd like you to see is that Jesus healed the sick to teach us about himself. Jesus healed while he was here on earth in order to make a statement, in order to offer, if you will, uh, some lessons about who he is. And it, you can think of it in the terms of offering uh, some kind of uh, identification. Uh, you understand the frustration uh, like I often do where uh, you're trying to get into an account online and you can't remember your password. Anybody ever experienced that? The truth is I have four passwords that I use, the same ones over and over again. And no, I will not tell you what they are because you have access to my entire life if I do that. And I still can't remember which one of the four I needed to use to get into that account. And then I get into the account and they ask me some random question about something I did years ago. And I don't remember what I, my password's not good enough. I've got to answer some random question to get in here. And then you have to call them on the phone and try to talk to them, and, and you give them your account name, your password, you tell them where you live, what year you were born, everything sort of your, short of your social security number, and you still can't get access to it. What, what's the point of having all this information if I can't get in? You know, we, we use passwords, identification cards, social security numbers, our fingerprints, uh, our DNA, all to identify so that we can have the authority and the access to do what we need to do. And Jesus, while he was here on earth, used his opportunities to heal people, to teach us about who he was, to reveal to us that he was the Son of God. That he was no ordinary man. That he was not some fraud just walking around claiming to be the son of God so that people would follow him. So that he could uh, build up a great deal of wealth. So that he could amass fame. No, he was saying that I am the son of God. I am different than uh, a mere humanity. That, that I am divine. That I was sent here by my father for a specific purpose. And it was all with the idea of giving some sort of credibility for him to be able to speak into the lives of the people that he was ministering to and helping to with the idea that they would place their faith and trust in him and become followers of Jesus Christ. Now again, uh, you, we, we sometimes fail to understand 
uh, why they struggle to believe, uh, but, but that's because we have the, uh, the whole counsel of God. We have the complete revealed scripture. They didn't have that opportunity. Uh, they were expecting something to look maybe a little bit different. They were a little bit confused about what was going on. And so these opportunities to heal gave Jesus the opportunity to say, hey, there is something unique about who I am, and that is because I am the very Son of God. The question that is presented when Jesus offers this man, this paralyzed man that is on the bed, that your sins are forgiven, the audience asks the right question. Who has the authority to, uh, to, to forgive sins but God? That is in verse 24 of, Matt, of Luke 5. That's the right question. I don't have the ability to forgive your sins. I don't have the ability to wipe your slate clean. I don't have the ability to uh, uh, make your account good with God. So they said, nobody but God can do that. And Jesus is saying, yep, that's right. And that's who I am. And he demonstrated that through his acts of healing. But he also wanted them to see the power and the ability that he had over disease. You look at this question in verse 24 again, uh, when Jesus says, uh, which is easier? Uh, to say that your sins are forgiven or to rise and walk. So they're confused over who he is, why he thinks he has the ability to do this. And he says, come on, which one's easier? For me to say your sins are forgiven or to make this man rise and walk. Now we would say that forgiving sins is more difficult. But Jesus said that actually forgiving of the sins was easier. Why did Jesus say that? Because there's no proof. There's no evidence, right? He could say to the man, your sins are forgiven, and yet that man still be enslaved in sin, still not be right with God. And so there's no physical evidence that Jesus had the power to forgive sins. And so he does the more difficult thing in their mind in telling this paralyzed man to get up and walk. Why? Because there is physical evidence that a man who was unable to get up off of his bed and walk is now able to stand and walk. He was demonstrating his power that he had. Again, he's unique. There's no one like him. Nobody has the ability to just through his words speak this into existence, and it happened. Now, a fraud would have the ability to bring along a companion and claim that he was paralyzed, and claimed that he had the opportunity to heal him. And they would be none the wiser. But when they saw a paralyzed man that they knew with their own eyes. Understood beyond any doubt that he was paralyzed. That Jesus had the opportunity or the ability to make him get up and walk. That was saying something. But he was also teaching us about his compassion. That he had towards those he healed. Switching back to the leper for just a moment. The leper is uh, dealing with his sickness, and we'll get into that in just a few moments. But uh, he's in a bad situation. He is uh, 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 with a disease that is very contagious. And he comes to Jesus and asks for healing. And all Jesus had to do was what he did to the paralyzed man and say, Hey, your leprosy is healed. Be healed. But what does the Bible tell Jesus does? The Bible says he reaches down and touches him. You know, that was probably the first time in years that that leper had been touched by anyone other than a fellow leper. Did Jesus have to do that? No. But we see in this story, we see in this event in Jesus' life the amount of compassion he had, uh, the amount of empathy that he shared with this man who was dealing with this disease of leprosy and his uh, understanding of his torment and his pain and wanting him to know that, hey, I love you. I care about you. I'm not unwilling to, uh, not, uh, to stand off from you like everybody else has done. I don't consider you to be like everybody else has considered you to be. No, I want you to feel my touch. It shows us Jesus' compassion. But I also believe that it shows us Jesus' desire to heal people. You know, I don't believe Jesus walked around this earth and were looking at people who were dealing with sickness and disease and, uh, and just able to walk by them without any amount of concern about their physical well-being. Do you know Jesus could have accomplished everything he wanted to accomplish here on this earth without ever healing anybody physically? Yet, because of his compassion that we talked about, because of his love and because of his concern, 
He healed them just simply because he desired to do so. In fact, when you look at the leper's statement to Jesus, he said, Lord, I I know that if you will. In, In other words, the leper did not struggle to believe that Jesus could. He questioned in his mind if Jesus would. He said, man, I'm a leper, I'm I'm unclean, I'm an outcast from society, nobody cares about me, nobody wants to be near me, Uh, nobody wants to touch me, nobody wants me living inside the gates of the city. Jesus, I don't expect you to heal me, but I know that if you will, and Jesus said, look, I will. Can I ask you, do you know those things about Jesus? Do you know his identity, who he is, and that he's different, that he truly was the Son of God, that he was the Messiah, that he was the only one capable of dying on the cross for your sins and mine, that he has the power to not only heal physically, but also to forgive our sins, that he has compassion for every single one of us. He cares about us, and he wants to heal us. Again, I know those things are simple. I know they're self-explanatory. You've been in church any amount of time. You know those things. But how often do you join with the crowds here and are amazed that Jesus would do those things? How often do you sit back, as we've kind of already talked about today, with, with appreciation for who Jesus is and the touch that he has placed on your life? I think far too often we get distracted by things that uh, seem more complex. We, uh, we, we study and we question things that we may not understand or that may seem hard to grasp and we get infatuated with all the shiny objects of Christianity that we fail to truly appreciate the basics of what Jesus did and who he is and what he wants to do in our own lives. And so as you study Luke's gospel specifically, but as you read about Jesus' life and, and you see these healing events, they're not just there for fluff. They're not just there to help us um, include some more pages of Scripture. No, they're there so that we can learn about who Jesus is. But there's a second thing it teaches us, and it teaches us about the people who were in need of healing. So he's wanting us to understand something about these people. What did he want us to understand? I told you it's going to be basic. They needed to be healed. They needed an intervention think about this leper and i can't go into leprosy and all of its details here um i'm really not qualified to do that but i do understand that it is a a very serious disease that affects uh most of if not all of the body but the way it was physically presented was uh, by the the boils and the scars and, and the rashes that come upon the person's skin And the only way they knew to deal with a leper in those times, the only remedy they had, and you're not going to want to hear this word, but it was by quarantining them. It was by excommunicating them from society, putting them out, because it was highly contagious to the touch. You touch them, more than likely you're going to get leprosy yourself. And it was an excruciating pain. Every single moment of every single day of this man's life, he lived with the reminder that he was a leper. Not just in how people treated him, but how the disease treated him. He was a sick man. He was a man that was without hope of ever experiencing normalcy in life. He was a man that stood in a desperate need of Jesus healing him. The paralyzed man. We don't know exactly how paralyzed he was. We don't know to the extent, was it from the waist down? Was it from the neck down? We just don't know. But needless to say, he was not physically able to walk. He was not physically able to transport himself to where Jesus was. And that in and of itself is all the explanation you needed to know about his need for healing. Can I tell you, Jesus was not a showboat. Jesus was not some uh, kind of Benny Hinn that was just there to uh, make it uh, uh, all about the the drama involved in it and the uh, questioning that some could have about the reality of what's going on and trying to, uh, again, amass some kind of, um, of, uh, of wealth or fame for himself. Jesus truly went to people 
who had no dealings with him face to face before. He came and encountered with their need and he healed them. These people were otherwise sentenced to death. They were otherwise sentenced to a life of misery. They were otherwise sentenced to a life of pain. They were otherwise sentenced to a life of hopelessness. If not, Jesus had been introduced to their lives and had he not healed them. What else does he want us to know about the people that he healed? He wants us to know that they had faith that he could heal them. That they believed that Jesus could. Look back at what it says about the leper in, in verse 13. The statement was, and Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him. Um, excuse me, let's back up there. In verse 12 it says, and when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and begged him, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. Now look at what it says in verse 20 about this man who had been paralyzed. And as he's brought into Jesus here, the Bible says, and when he saw their faith... He said, man, your, son, your sins are forgiven you. And I used to, as reading that before and even this week, I'm questioning. Was Jesus talking about the, the faith of the four men who carried this young man into Jesus and because of their faith, the sins of the man on the bed was forgiven? And it, and it just all of a sudden, the, the light bulb finally came on and said, I believe uh, that, that he's talking about the faith of the paralyzed man just as much. Can you imagine being a paralyzed person, you're not able to walk for yourself, and your four friends come in and said, hey, we'd like to carry you on a stretcher to see this man named Jesus. And you think through all of the difficulty that would bring, you might even have the idea that, look, I don't want to put you guys through that much trouble. You go, you have fun, and I'll sit here and wait for the report when you get on. But no, he let him carry him. And then on top of that, he was willing to allow them to lower him down through the roof of someone's house so that he could encounter Jesus. Now, I'm sure he couldn't put up too much of a fight at that point. But do you think you would have taken that without fussing or complaining? I don't know. I probably don't have four friends I trust enough <laughs> to lower me down in that way. So it was his own faith. It was all his own belief that if he could come in contact with Jesus, that they would, he would heal them. I believe it also makes a, another statement that they wanted Jesus to heal them. I believe we can learn these things about why Jesus healed. But can I bring this home for you? Can I, can I allow us to truly understand why I believe Jesus healed the sick, and why Luke put it in the pages of his account. And that is to teach us about ourselves. I, I believe the mistake we often make when we look at the healing ministry of Jesus and the miracles of Jesus is we focus on the picture that is given instead of the teaching that is taking place behind the scenes and our frustration in our faith in our belief in Jesus many people's testimony of why they just can't come to terms with God being real God being all-powerful God being loving God being caring for us is because again they're expecting Jesus to do the same work physically for them that he did in, in, in those times in those ministries we've already talked about that but what I want you to see here is not that Jesus came to earth to give us a good life and to make us always physically healthy. Because every single person that Jesus healed, whether it was of leprosy or whether it was of paralysis or even if it was of death, would eventually die of some kind of cause, more than likely some kind of disease. Jesus did not come to make our lives prosperous. Jesus, nowhere in Scripture, promises you and I that if we have some kind of physical disease, if we would place our faith in Christ, that we would be healed. So what's the point? Well, the point is in the picture. And what I hope we can see is that our spiritual need, our spiritual sickness, is represented in their physical sickness. That our spiritual disease 
is what Jesus was healing in their physical disease. So let me draw the picture here for you and help you to understand the, the, the analogy of what we see from these events. Sin is a disease that will kill us. The Bible says in the book of Romans, chapter number 6, verse 23, that the wages of sin is death. And then it goes on to say, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now you say, Brother Daniel, what is the disease of sin? What, what even is sin? How, how do we relate that to our lives today? Well, simply put, sin is any action, attitude, thought, deed, response that we have that transgresses God's created order and plans for our lives. So a sin is something that goes against God's will, that it goes against His order. Can I tell you that sin is not just some made-up standard that we have instituted just to control people's lives, just to keep people from having fun, just because we're narrow-minded or still living in the olden days, that sin is a real thing. Sin is set in stone. It is concrete. It is there. It is plain to see. Have some people described some things in the past as sin that are not sin? Yes. But that does not mean sin, sin does not exist. And can I tell you also that death being the result of sin is not the result of God being some angry being in heaven that just looks up and say, okay, you sin, I want to punish you. You sin, I want to make your life miserable. You sin, I want to do what I can to destroy your fun. No, death is the result of sin naturally. It naturally destroys our lives. It naturally separates us from God. It naturally leads us to a lack of joy, a lack of peace, a lack of happiness. And so when we look at the leper, for instance, and we see the way that sin or the disease had destroyed his life, it is a reminder of the way that sin destroys our own lives. And because of that sin, there is consequences. Uh, there, there are daily reminders that you and I have of the sin that we have committed, the, the choices that we've made, uh, the, the misery that it brings on, the, the, the distress that it brings, the way that it destroys relationships, the way that it causes us to uh, face division that we had never faced, and the torment that we face in our own lives. That is what sin does for us. And as you look at someone that Jesus is looking at, there is a clear need in their lives for physical healing. And my friend, there is a clear need in our lives for spiritual healing because we are spiritually sick. We have a problem that we cannot fix ourselves. We have an issue that must be dealt with. So sin is our sickness that needs to be met. But I also want you to understand today that our spiritual cure is seen in their physical cure. Again, at that time in those days, these particular diseases, leprosy and paralysis, there was absolutely no hope that they were going to be healed. The only uh, uh, relief that was ever going to come was through death. The doctors didn't have a solution for it. There was no medicine that would bring even the slightest amount of relief for it. It was just simply put, you're going to be uh, just, you just have to accept this. And Jesus, or a miracle, divine intervention, was the absolute only way they were ever going to experience healing. And I want you to understand this morning that the only answer to this spiritual sickness of sin is Jesus. The, the only answer is that he miraculously intervenes and delivers us from our sin. That he miraculously intervenes and delivers us from the punishment of our sin. That he would miraculously intervene and touch us and give us a solution that cannot be found elsewhere. But our problem is, even after salvation, is we oftentimes look for other solutions ourselves. As we're living in misery, we seek out the pleasures of life. As we're struggling with the guilt of our own sin, we look for things that will drown it out even more, that will numb us to our pain and misery. We'll try to ignore it. We'll try to sleep on it. We'll try to find some other avenue to distract us from that pain that we're feeling. 
But that doesn't fix the problem. Sort of like pain medication they give you. Pain medication does not take away your pain. The pain is still there. You're just numb to it. You just don't feel it. You come off that pain medication, you're supposed to start feeling pain again, right? If there's still the problem there. And the only thing that fixes it is to fix the true source of the pain. And my friend, we must understand that we can try all we want to mask the penalty, the difficulties, the, uh, the, the associated pain with sin. But the only way to truly find a cure for it is to find and to place our faith and trust in Jesus. But I also want you to understand this morning that our spiritual healing is seen in their physical healing. A couple things we notice about Jesus healing these people first one is you notice that it's a complete healing when jesus commanded the leper said i will and touched him and be healed and he looked at the man that was uh, uh, struggling with the the paralysis get up and walk the man immediately got up and walked it was a complete it, it really solved every single physical issue they had that was leading to the disease that they had experienced it wiped it all away completely but it also did it immediately. It, it wasn't a situation where Jesus said, hey, I'm going to touch you, and a few weeks later you're going to be able to experience the, uh, the joys of that healing. No, immediately his skin went back to normal. Immediately the nerve endings that he hadn't been able to feel for years were restored. Immediately the, the rashes were gone. Immediately the things that were going on inside of the body had been taken care of. For the man that was paralyzed, immediately those uh, blockages that were happening, so his, uh, the information wasn't getting from his brain to his, uh, his arms and his legs. And I'm going to stop trying to be too medically correct, okay? I'm going to get myself in trouble. Immediately was fixed. Many of you know I had nose surgery uh, two, weeks, two and a half weeks ago. I still can't breathe yet. I went to the doctor, and he said it would be six weeks before I'd really be able to experience the benefits of my surgery. But because I used Brother Danny in an illustration this morning, if he takes me in my office and punches me one good time in the nose, I'll never experience the benefits of that healing. Right? I'll need to, I'll need to go back. That's not what it's like with Jesus. When you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, it's immediate. It happens immediately. Your sins are wiped away. The guilt that you experience is gone. The punishment that you were facing has been extinguished. All of it, 100% of it, is completely gone. You've been completely healed by Jesus Christ. To wrap this all up and to bring it to a close, what I want you to think about is the struggle that we often have even as believers with this idea of spiritual healing because sometimes we just don't feel healed. Sometimes sin pops up its ugly head in our lives and we give in, we struggle with it. We do things we know we ought not to do. Sometimes we are dealing with guilt and shame from sins that we committed years ago and wondered why we allowed ourselves to go down those paths. And one of the most frustrating things spiritually can be the doubts of why other people can experience the joy of the Lord, but I can't. Why they have experienced healing and why they are living such a great life and everything seems to be going well for them, but man, I'm dealing with misery when I'm away from everybody. When nobody's watching me, I'm still struggling with these fears and doubts and questions. Well, I illustrated in a sobering way. A few years ago, I read an article about a, uh, a track athlete for the University of Pennsylvania who had tragically taken her own life. She was only 19 years of age. You look at her social media profiles, and it would seem like her life was the picture 
of what life for a 19-year-old in this country should be like. She had all the things that appeared she wanted. It looked like she was enjoying life. She was laughing. She was smiling. She was having a good time. She was a, a, a scholarship athlete, again, at the University of Pennsylvania. When they started to do a dive into her life, what they understood was that this young lady had been struggling with depression for years. And the result of her depression was that she was watching everyone else's life. They looked happy, yet she knew hers was fake. They looked like they had all the things in the world that they wanted and it was bringing them pleasure, and yet she knew all those things she wanted was bringing her anything but pleasure. They looked like they had their life together, and she knew inside she was uh, nowhere near put together. And she struggled with this idea that everyone else's life is good, but mine's miserable. And I do believe that for all of us, as you listen to this most obvious message about who Jesus is, about the people that needed to be healed, even about our own sins, and say, Brother Daniel, that sounds great and all, but I just haven't yet experienced the reality of that. And I just want to leave you just with just a couple of reminders and that is to remind you that Jesus has already accomplished on the cross of Calvary everything that was necessary for your healing. I read this morning in our scripture reading from the book of Isaiah chapter number 53. It's a prophecy of Jesus' coming crucifixion. Like a lamb led to the slaughter. It talks about how uh, even though he knew no sin, he was able to take upon himself our sin. It talked about how uh, by his wounds we are healed. Can I tell you, that is not a physical healing, but it is a spiritual healing. Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary did not pay for his own sin, did not take the wrath of God upon him because of what he did. He looked down through the annals of history and saw everybody that would ever live, including you and me, and said, I'm going to take upon myself their sin. Sin that you committed years ago, sin that you might commit today, and sin that you have yet to commit, Jesus Christ took on the weight of that, the guilt of that, the punishment of that, and did what was necessary so that we could experience healing. Can I remind you this morning that Jesus has promise to us in his word that if we would just believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we will be saved? Not maybe, not, not perhaps, not if you win the lottery, not if you're good enough afterwards, not if you meet these set of standards in life, you will be saved. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 9 that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Again, it's not about our actions, it's not about our works, it's not about our performance, it's not about what we, what, how bad our sin was. There's no exceptions. What he's offered to do for one of us, he has offered to do for all of us. But can I also remind you that he knows you're unclean? And yet he still reached down to touch you. He knows you're a sinner. He knows that even as a believer that your flesh is still weak. He knows what you're made of. He knows the choices you'll make before you ever make them. And yet he doesn't think of you any less. He doesn't love you any less. Can I tell you, he's not surprised when you sin. Do you hear what I said? He's not surprised when you sin. He's not taken off guard. He doesn't change his mind about you when you sin. I heard it put this way this past week. It's kind of a sports analogy, and I, I try to stay away from those a little too much, but the guy was saying that, you know, like when, when a, a team drafts a player, they're, they're oftentimes caught off guard by things they didn't know about the player. And sometimes a couple years down the road, they'll have to go to them and say, hey, you, you know, we, we thought you were going to be a great fit here, but you're just not working out. 
we thought you were going to be a great fit for the team, but, I mean, you're just not what we thought you were, so we have to let you go. Jesus doesn't do that with us. He hasn't accepted us on the team and said, man, I didn't know about all this baggage in your life. This just isn't going to work out. We accepted you on the team, but we didn't know you were going to wander away at some point and start doing some things you know aren't right, so we, we just can't have you on the team anymore. Can I tell you that Jesus, when he heals us, doesn't bring up our past anymore. He doesn't love us any less when we fail. Can I encourage you today, if you're not a believer, man, would you please place your trust in him? He wants to heal you of your spiritual sin. And you said, Brother Daniel, I just don't feel sick. Well, maybe your first prayer is, God, would you help me feel sick? God, would you help me to feel the weight of my sin? God, would you help me to come to a true understanding of what it means to transgress your law? God, would you help me to come to a true understanding of what my sin nature is doing to me and how it is ruining my life and will destroy it for all of eternity? Would you beg God to show you that? And you say, Brother Daniel, I'm a believer. Can I ask you to leave here today knowing you've been completely healed 100% immediately at the time of salvation, really at the time of the cross, it's already been accomplished you don't have to work for it. You don't, try to be, you don't have to try to behave for it. You don't try to have to meet a standard to earn it. You don't try to have to act a certain way to get there. And you don't have to continue to live under the guilt and the weight of the things that you've done. You don't have to live under that shame. Know that you have been healed. Even when you don't feel like it. And then can you live that way? Can you imagine the shame it would have been with this I'm done? If Jesus looked down at that paralyzed man and said, hey, get up and walk. He got up and walked, but then when he got home, he put his cot back down and went back to laying on it perpetually. In his mind, he kept feeling the numbness in his legs or for the leper to continually look at his skin and start scratching it because of the boils and the scars that are there. If he had continued living on the outside of the gates of the city because he knew he had been ostracized and outcast. Can you imagine the insanity of that leper that would not go back into his family home and hug the people that he loved and cared about? You say, Brother Daniel, that's insane. Well, it's just as insane for you and I to look at the cross, to sing about the cross, to know that Jesus hung there and walk out of here saying, man, I can't believe the things I've done. To walk out of here still living under the shame of things that were taken care of years ago. To still in your own effort say, I know that it's all Jesus, but yeah, man, I've got to really straighten up my life. It would be the same thing. We've been healed. We've been forgiven. It was complete. It was immediate. It's all been taken care of. It is all the blood of Jesus Christ. Why did Jesus heal in Scripture? To teach us about himself. To teach us about what he could do for those who were in need. But also to teach us about our spiritual sickness. And that if Jesus could do something as simple as causing a leper to be clean... And causing a paralyzed man to get up and walk, man, he could do something so miraculous as to reach down and save my soul and to save your soul.